Hi, everyone. It is Wednesday. It is the 22nd of September, and we are here for the Knowledge Bolide Weekly Hangout sponsored by Topher Spin Meteorites. The room is full of smiling faces because I couldn't get started today for some reason, but we're going to just jump right into the science. We have Cliff, who is a newer collector with us, and he recently placed an order with me. And on that order, I gave him a few little slices for free. And Cliff, we have you highlighted now. Okay. So this, um, this was a kind of a really interesting uh, visual, especially for, for a new collector who hadn't run into it before. Uh, you, the, you can see the uh, uh, metal flakes that are shining pretty bright white in the image. But there are also what appear to be, at least to an untrained eye, uh, vesticles, small indentations into the surface of the cut which uh, was a little surprising because I hadn't, at least in the images that I perused, I hadn't run into that before. So I, I wanted to uh, hop on and ask if anyone can tell me how something like that might form. Okay, great, great example and great question because one of the things like we get asked a lot to identify meteorites. And one of the things that we always tell people is, you know, we're not looking for things that are porous and with holes and vesicles in them. So um, I'm going to invite our our crew member, Daniel Shake, uh, who's also a uh, meteorite classifier to give us some type of information of what we might be looking at and when and where is a vesicle and how does it compare to a terrestrial vesicle? That's way too much to throw at you. Well, I'll, I'll try my best to, to answer some of those questions. So to start off with the term vesicle is essentially from a geologic standpoint, a vesicle is just uh, what we call a trapped air bubble. So when you're forming this rock, initially you had either, for example, lava on the surface, and you had trapped gas that was in the lava. And when you crystallize out the rock, essentially you leave behind these depressions inside of the, the rock, and they're basically holes that the, the mm. gas escaped from. So we call those vesicles. Now on Earth, we see vesicles primarily if you look at, uh, you know, if you go to Hawaii, you can see lava flows and you see how they cool and you see the rocks that form. Those have vesicles. They're basically restricted mostly to volcanic rocks. So rocks you'd see on the surface. In terms of speaking extraterrestrially, so like, for example, with uh, other meteorites and other kinds of groups, the reason why most people say that most meteorites don't contain vesicles or if you find anything that has vesicles, it's likely not a meteorite is it's not trying to deter people to not pick up those rocks, but it's mostly trying to go stick by a rule as opposed to the mm -hmm. exceptions. And yeah. basically most meteorites that fall to earth are what we call chondrites. So these are what we call, these are a type of stony meteorite. And these types of meteorites don't really contain vesicles in them and they make up the majority of you know 87 to 90 ish percent of all the mm -hmm. meteorites that are found on earth so you know finding a rock that has a vesicle if you're if you're trying to give it to someone who has a trained eye it's it's normally something advised that it's not part of a meteorite but there are exceptions yes and so exactly this rock right here that cliff is showing uh i i, I can't see it too well it's a little hard for me to see because some of the the albedo from some of those grains i can't exactly identify those but those holes you see right there are examples of vesicles you find and some meteorite groups actually do have vesicles in them that, that is awesome i know i just got some <clears throat> zarev cut which was a proposed witness fall because it was found two years after and exactly where they thought it would be but it is uh, known for its uh, porosity or being full of uh, vesicles, but this is a great example, Cliff. I'm I'm glad that you I'm glad you spotted it. I'm glad you questioned it and uh, and brought it to our attention. It, just, it seemed like there was something for me to learn there because I, I I didn't doubt that you were knew knew what you were doing, <laughs> so I, I was pretty sure. It's like okay, uh, you know, it's I'm missing something here because I I, I had seen. The advice online that you know that basically what he just said like if 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 you see those it's probably not a meteorite it's like well mm -hmm. i'm seeing them but i'm pretty sure it is so yeah 
So there's, I, I was curious what the disconnect was. So that that's useful. So th this would be some kind of a essentially a metamorphic process in space that would do that, or so, some some kind of process that would trap some sort of void in in an, in the parent body. Yeah, much much like. Uh, well, go ahead, Daniel. I saw you unmute yourself. Well, if anyone else wants to uh, to chime in, they're they're more than welcome to. If if no one else wants to say anything, then I'll be happy to. It's all the mic's all you for now, buddy. Thank you. So, generally speaking, uh, when you see when you see vesicles in a meteorite, that that could be one of two processes. The first was that the meteorite formed uh, from a melt, so it's a it's basically an igneous rock that crystallized from okay. lava either on the surface or a little bit below the surface. But to get vesicles, to see vesicles means that the the lava had to have cooled quickly into a rock because if you have slow cooling, uh, you know, you're not going to really see that sort of feature. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the main ways. But the second way is through, uh, through impact melting. So if you look at rocks from the moon, the most common rock on the moon you find are primarily, or meteorites you find, I should specify, meteorites that you find that are from the moon are called feldspathic, lunar feldspathic breccias, meaning they're just made up of a specific mineral called feldspar, and they contain some other accessory stuff in it. But what really makes th those stand out are the fact that if you look within some of these lunar feldspathic breccias, you see tiny vesicles, and that mainly forms as the lunar surface is being bombarded by all kinds of meteorites, and that creates, of course, the, the heat driven by the impact creates melting of, of some part, and because, you know, the temperatures there are very cold, the melt cools very quickly, you form glasses, and of course you have gas trying to escape, so you have some vesicles that form. So that's another way you see it. So those are the two main ways that you can get vesicles. Do you see um, a lack of vesicles in shock material? It really depends what you're looking at. Uh, so, you know, generally speaking, there are there are samples that generally if you if you if you see vesicles it it generally means that the sample has been shocked to a very high degree but mm. it also means that you had to have reached temperatures that you're able to melt material and cool it quickly and you know there's there there are for example some like for example if you look at some chondrites that have been shocked heavily uh, you actually have a mineral in their feldspar, which, which, re which recrystallizes and forms a diaplectic, basically forms a glass called mascalinite. And some of these mascalinites actually have tiny holes in them, which, which are likely small vesicles that formed from the shock melting and quenching process. So generally, the more shocked something is, likely the, you know, the the higher the temperatures it likely reached and the quicker it probably cooled. So the more likely I would assume you'd see vesicles. That's really interesting. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. If I could chime in now, I'm, uh, I'm not a professional. <laughs> I'm not degreed in this field. No, uh, Pat, but... you know, Pat, you know a lot about meteorites. Pat, <laughs> Pat knows a lot about meteorites. In fact, you actually know more than me and some of these areas too. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that, Daniel, but <laughs> thank you for the kind <laughs> Take work. it, buddy. But, you but, you but take that. Th there are a couple of other mechanisms too that, uh, that can form um, uh, vesicles. In some very weathered meteorites, uh, the um, iron sulfides and even the iron grains can weather out and diffuse into the into the bulk of the rock and leave uh, small holes. Um, an, actually, I guess there's three. Uh, an, another one is that in, and this is one of my pet theories and who knows if it's correct or not, but it seems to me that very primitive type threes uh, oftentimes have little voids in the chondrules that appear to be from uh, lack of full melting of the chondrule or possibly uh, relic grains um, uh, incorporated into a chondrule that that were not uh, remelted. 
Uh, and then also we have seen, in a, it's very, very, very rare, but we have seen in a few meteorites um, halite crystals in, in the bulk of the meteorite. And when those meteorites are cut with water as a lubricant, of course, the halite uh, dissolves out and it halite leaves is behind. Halite is another form of a salt crystal. Yeah, it's a salt, yes. Uh, and so it leaves behind a hole. Uh, so, um, in, I, I do a lot of, a lot of work on, on, is it a meteorite and meteorite or meteor wrong and meteorite real, et cetera, uh, doing, uh, helping people with identification. And, uh, generally the way I phrase that is, uh, the difference between, uh, you know, slag and, uh, other, uh, lava, other uh, sort of uh, materials like that, is that the, the the bubbles are from expanding gas, and in meteorites we generally don't see that. Although there's always exceptions, um, and then there's some wonderful weirdos like um, the uh, uh, Albright. Uh, I'm not going to say the name of it. Derbigny or Derbigny. Thank you, Tober. Um, that have these wonderful round little vesicles in them that uh, uh, are super interesting. So thank you. Excellent points, Pat. Really good. I, I actually so, have a piece. I actually have a piece of uh, <clears throat> the Orbigny here and it is a Angrite, not an Albright. Oh, thank you. But <clears throat> this is what it looks like. And you will see, yeah, it's quite expensive, <laughs> which is why I only have a small sample. But if you look on the back side, you will see it does have a vesicle right there. Mm -hmm. There's two of them, actually. And no, I'm not taking it out of the frame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Dior Bigney is definitely uh, an angrite, and it's known, well, it, it, it's known to have vesicles. Um, then, obviously, Daniel said melts. So any impact melt, like for instance, Tacit at 004 is prolific to have uh, very small porous vesicles, not really voids, but more small vesicles and pores. Um, I've seen a few somewhere else. Um, let me see here. Um, we, had a, we had a question from some, some people online who, who enjoyed our Meteorite 101 series but it kind of got chopped up and it's and it's in a bunch of uh, a bunch of episodes and stuff but i wanted to just maybe that we can just go around the horn everyone think of a, a kind of a basic fact about meteorites and we can all share it so i'm going to start with my first very generic entry level meteorite 101 facts of meteorites i'm going to cheat off daniel as he already <laughs> said Upwards of 87% of all meteorites that are recovered on Earth are chondrites. Chondrites are also called stonies. So stony meteorites are chondrites. They are called chondrites because in the middle of them, when you slice them, you'll see chondrules, little round grains, little round balls of the silicates and other minerals. So those chondrules are in the stonies that are make up about just under 90% of all meteorites found on earth. So that's my basic level meteorite fact. Who wants to go next? Do the chondrules tend to be about two millimeters in size most of the time? If so, do a thin section of it because I want it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, those are, um, chondrules, uh, yeah. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom in on Daniel real quick because he, he can show us uh, scale. Well, I was, I was actually going to, I actually had something interesting to, to show off. Oh. Oop, let me see if this even shows later oh. on. <laughs> wow. Yeah, this is something I'm researching right now. But, Jeez. But, uh, so that... so the, these are actually, this is, this is does anyone want to take a guess what this is? Is it a megachondral? So that's what I purchased, this, purchased it. As a few years ago when I was an undergrad, I bought two slices of NWA8773. It's, it was classified as an L3, but it's been reclassified as an LL3. And this was uh, advertised as a megachondral. So I bought two identical slices 
I sent one in for isotopic work and the other one I made a thin section of. And it turns out this actually isn't a chondral at all. This is an H class. Cool. So it's, a, so wow. it's, it's something called in. So generally when we talk about rocks, we can talk about chondrites specifically, almost like rocks that have clasts, which are like big grains contained within smaller grains, which we call a matrix that sort of holds it together. So in this case, chondrules are the clasts. So they're the rounded spherules here, these igneous mm -hmm. spherules. And this is what's called a xenolith, which means it's a foreign clast that generally speaking, it doesn't belong with everything else. So it's pretty unique because finding these types of clasts and you know these types of chondrites are relatively rare, especially something this size. So yeah. that'd be cool to show. Wow, that. way cool. Thank Beautiful. you. Yeah. I could, I could only imagine the, like the cutter who first cut that open or something like that. You'd probably be able to see it on the outside of the stone. Um, mm -hmm. But most, most of the, uh, of the chondrules are, are I'm, I'm really poor with size. They're, they're very, very small on a uh, or magnitude of, um, you know, millimeters. You know, you're, I think, I don't know if you said millimeters or centimeters earlier, so I apologize, but they're, they're every once in a while you, you get a nice big size one, you know, seven to eight to nine millimeters is, is oh. a really sub substantial size chondral. That'll grab someone's attention at least. Yeah, the, the average size varies per, per group. So some chondrites, for example, uh, for example, like this one right here, this is called a CO chondrite. The chondrules here are very tiny. You can't really even see them, even though it's been cut bad, but they're about 100, 150 microns. So that's, so a thousand microns makes a millimeter. So that's like 0. 0.1 millimeters. But then you have some, you know, some types of chondrites called CV chondrites that have giant chondrules that are about, like uh, Arthur was saying, one to two millimeters in size yeah. for those chondrules. So you can get a large range in size. Yeah. And that was uh, maybe that's something we can touch on about uh, the, the meteorite 101. I'll kind of lead Pat into this discussion. Um, there are three, we're talking about chondrites. So we're talking about stony meteorites. In that main classification of chondrites, there are a lot of broken down categories. The three main categories that we're going to discuss or keep in mind. And we're keeping these in mind and discussing them because it really fits the majority of the meteorites in the majority of the, uh, the classification that falls the most on earth. So we'd rather focus on 95% mass than the outliers and try to find the weird Martian achondrite and the next, you know, uh, altered lunar here on earth. You know, let, we're being realistic about this. So in the chondrites, there's three main classes. There's the L, the LL and the H. And the way I remember it is LL is super low metal, L is low metal, and H is mid or high metal. And I have a video on the YouTube channel uh, called um, Magnet Test or something with magnet in the title. And it breaks down all the various um, amounts of metal total in the meteorite and free metal. So what I'm going to do now is ask Pat to talk about after you see a chondrite classified as an LL, an L, or an H, you see numbers after it. And that number represents its lithography. And why does it go from three to seven? What does a 3.0 mean? And what does a one mean? And where, where the hell would you get a one if the scale only goes from three to seven? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will try. So uh, the, um, the meteorites we're talking about here are ordinary chondrites. There are other classes of chondrites, carbonaceous chondrites, uh, et cetera, but uh, we're talking ordinary chondrites, OCs, and the scale starts at 3.00. Um, chondrites are uh, important in that they contain chondrules, which they're named after. Jim is going to show us some wonderful little chondrules. And chondrules are actually historically important too because they led to the idea that meteorites came from space and were not local rocks because they found these rocks all over the earth with these little balls in them uh, called chondrules. So um, we talk about uh, 
how primitive or how evolved uh, or metamorphosed uh, meteorites are, um, we do have kind of an odd scale. 3.00 is the least metamorphosed, least altered uh, ordinary chondrite. And this, this numbering scheme works for other chondrites as well. Uh, and then as we go from three, so in a type three, you can see all the chondrules. Uh, you take a slice and look at it. It's pretty much wall to wall chondrules with a tiny bit of matrix in between them. It's pretty much just chondrules squished together in a rock. When you go to four, you still see a bunch of chondrules, but there's more matrix in between. And as you go to higher and higher numbers to five to six and even to seven, there is more uh, metamorphism. So time at heat and pressure. And that metamorphism breaks down the chondrules through solid state recrystallization. And they become less and less uh, visible. And, and if you take a slice of a meteorite, look at it, there are fewer and fewer chondrules that are visible. And by the time you get all the way to a type seven, the chondrules are pretty much all completely erased. Uh, so we started at three. Why did we start at three? I don't know. It's written in the books that way. But when we go from three down to two and down to one, we're talking about alteration of the chondrites and, on, and the chondrules in them, but it's a different kind of alteration. It's alteration with exposure to liquid water, which is really exciting because water means life as we understand it. And so a CM2 would be a carbonaceous uh, Megali type uh, uh, meteorite that has been altered by the presence of water. There are also ones like C1 um, where uh, it's been quite altered by the presence of water. Now our numbering system is not perfect. There are some weird exceptions. Uh, we see uh, in, the, in the very primitive uh, type threes, we occasionally see some evidence of uh, aqueous alteration of alteration by water. But let's, let's spend a, a, just a quick minute with the threes. The type threes uh, are, the, are the most primitive. They're not metamorphosed. And instead of just going three, four, five, six, seven, uh, the threes have been subdivided. There's a beautiful uh, type three that Topher is showing with all sorts of wonderful little chondrules in it and a couple lithologies. Um, so uh, the, the threes have been broken down to 3.0, 3.1, 3.2, et cetera. Uh, and that it's still metamorphism with temperature and pressure, but it's a very finer uh, uh, way of looking at how much metamorphism there is. And then um, Grossman et al. wrote another paper uh, and uh, looked at uh, the migration of chromium uh, in the meteorites. And they found that it was justified to have classifications of 3.00, 3.05, 3.15. Uh, and so those are the meteorites that are really pristine, have not been affected by heat and pressure. And uh, those things are a thousand bucks a gram? Um, <laughs> no, don't exaggerate. They're only 400 bucks a gram. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't bought any is why I don't know. <laughs> I have a few and I managed to wheel and deal to 400 bucks a gram and it's been a while. So they may be a thousand bucks a gram now. Okay. Um, but th those materials I think are very fascinating because they really are, uh, chunks of the original material that our, uh, planetary disc uh, formed from. So I hope that wasn't too complicated, but yeah. let, let's... Pat, Pat, can I ask a quick question there? You bet. Is the 3.15, the subclass one, more primitive than just a 3.1, or is 3.1 like between 0 0.5 and 1.5? Good question. So uh, the way the, that uh, metamorphism scale evolved is they started just with uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, 
and then uh, Grossman and et al wrote a paper arguing for a finer degree of of breakdown in the type threes so we got 3.0 3.1 3.2 3.3 and then a few years later grossman and et al wrote another paper that argued for an even finer breakdown so a 3.1 is not the same as a 3.10 so if you look in the met bowl and you see something that's a 3.1 it was uh, recla or classified under the first scheme that Grossman uh, gave for breaking down the type threes. Uh, but if it is a 3.10, uh, then it's under the, the new scheme, newest scheme. So, so to summarize a little bit and put it in bullet points, the the L, LL, and the H represents how much metal the, the chondrite has. And then as you go from the three to seven, you're getting worse, if you will. You're getting more altered, and that alteration is by heat and pressure. As you go down from three down to two and one, you're switching out of ordinary chondrites, the stony chondrites, and you're getting into carbonaceous chondrites. And that alteration, it will be perfect at zero, but it goes in a degrading scale, negative from two to one. And is, am I correct in saying that? We're, we're, what's perfect on carbonaceous? Zero? Uh, it, it, so no aqueous alteration is three. Okay. Uh, and Daniel, please spot me here if I'm wrong. Uh, but I think it goes three and then two is somewhat altered and one is even more altered. Yep, that's that's correct. Yeah. Okay, 3. thank you. Daniel. Three point zero zero is is regarded as the most primitive. Right. Okay, so that's the crossing line at three zero. It's perfect, and then as, as you go down, it's getting more and more alteration altered. But this alteration is not by heat and pressure. It's more aqueous, water based. Right. So, all right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all your guys' help on that today. Um, we have a VIP who's joining us right now, <clears throat> our newly <clears throat> enthroned CFO of oh, Topher Spin Meteorites. <laughs> my, chief, my chief fun officer is here, my beautiful wife, Sue. Hello. <laughs> hey, guys. Did you have Can an announcement? Or you just, you just spying on us. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep. All right. Well, um, hi guys, hope you're doing well. I just wanted to join for a few minutes and I guess uh, see some of the new faces because we're just, I don't know, getting more members lately. And uh, also I wanted to uh, thank everybody that has participated in the survey so far. I'm kind of overwhelmed with the number of responses that we've received. And also I think a lot of you guys have a great sense of humor because <laughs> I'm reading some of the answers and they're really funny. Um, <laughs> So um, there's definitely going to be more than one raffle prize. So um, I will be raffling those off at the live sale um, a week from this Saturday, I think. Yes, okay. a week from this Saturday. So and these are prizes. All. These are prizes that you designed and made yourself. I had nothing to do with them, right? That is correct. Yeah, I'm, ta I'm taking over on the back end. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs> I, I can I can truly say you are the most beautiful woman in meteorites. Um, Stop. <laughs> um, Sue is helping me out a lot with because uh, the business is growing and, and as most people know or don't know this is a part-time gig for me I have a full-time 40-hour week job <clears throat> and this is my passion this is what I do to relax believe it or not so if you reach out to Toperspin Meteorites there's a good chance that Sue may be replying to you and uh, <clears throat> she's really good. Uh, at, she has she has people skills. Some, some, something that I'm lacking at times. Uh, <laughs> and someone who, uh, who is come into the uh, Knowledge Bolide crew, uh, Jeff, I'm talking about you, uh, is Jeffrey Dave DeVries. Uh, this cat is a uh, new I don't, a new collector. I'm going to say you can correct me. Uh, he's in Canada. Yeah. And he made me an extremely successful curator slash dealer. And he now is the proud owner of something amazing. Jeff, take it over, buddy. Well, actually, I got a little bit more exciting news than that. Um, I got 
my other <laughs> uh, surprise in the mail today as well. So oh nice, uh, we'll, we'll start. We'll, yeah, so, thank you. So yeah, um, I'll, I'll start with. Let me see here. Get my computer skills going here. All righty. So first item here is this unbelievable spring water uh, uh, sample here, 23.9 grams. Um, absolutely beautiful. Um, when I saw this available for sale uh, with how large the slice was, um, mm -hmm. I was ecstatic uh, to, to be able to purchase it. So um, it, it was a few days of, of waiting for it to show up in the mail and a nail biter hoping it would get through customs in time and not, not held up or anything. Mm -hmm. So um, I was super excited about that. And then, right um, yeah, so I got that here yesterday. And then uh, this morning, I went And that's to super the, special to you being a Canadian and a Canadian collector. You betcha. You betcha. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, um, I predominantly try to collect uh, Canadian, uh, Canadian meteorite samples. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, th th this particular piece being from close by from Saskatchewan is, is definitely uh, is precious. And, and the other piece is, is like, this is the only, uh, this is the only palisite, uh, to my knowledge, that has fallen in, in Canada to this point. So um, mm -hmm. also kind of neat that way. So, so yeah. And then wow. um, I got my other package here. Sue was actually, had uh, mentioned that she had decorated it. Um, she had uh, done some Facebook creeping on me and <laughs> saw that I was a, a Star Wars fan and, and uh, an astronomy fan and whatnot. So she had decorated up, uh, up my box here. And um, actually, I should show... Um, there was some some special gifts in there. I'm wearing my Topher shirt here. This is awesome. <laughs> You're the <laughs> sexiest man in meteorites. I, <laughs> I, I, get, I get excited with geeky shirts, so I was super excited to see that. And nice. then um, there was another gift that was thrown in there. Um, uh, as far as uh, uh, some uh, some glass shard samples from the Chelebinks meteorite. Uh, uh, fall so that was cool so then it got me uh, to pull out my Chelebink sample here that I got um, mm -hmm. what size is this uh, 4.2 gram piece that I got here um, nice. so I was excited to pull that out nice and then now, yeah now, the, now completes the set exactly I was super excited I was like adds that extra provenance right so mm -hmm. I was super excited about that and then um, yeah the piece de resistance is um, I'm just gonna move this over here. Is um, trust me, you guys, here. it's worth waiting on. All right, so yeah, so this this is Buzz the largest um, piece of buzzard coolie that I, I've come across um, for sale this far. Uh, it was uh, two halves, um, roughly around 74 and a half grams each, or 75 grams each, so 151 in total. Um, <laughs> Very, very nice piece. I haven't seen a piece like this ever for sale, actually. So um, I think my next largest piece is around that uh, 20 gram mark. So this this definitely bumped up my, my collection size considerably. Yeah. So nice um, ve very nice. Those are some extremely serious Canadian uh, meteorites. Nice, nicely collected. Yep. And I, and I have to, I have to throw some praise. Um, I, I hope you don't mind, Jeff, Jeffrey, Jaybird, no, no worries, <laughs> um, J Rod, whatever. Um, <laughs> I, I had these two stones here for sale for quite some time, and I had them listed on my price uh, online inventory as sold as a set. I had these things could have been sold six times over to different collectors one at a time. And I refused to do it. It was imperative for me as a curator, more than a dealer, to hold on to it until I found someone who appreciated having the complete stone mm -hmm. and would keep it as such. I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna kill you yeah. five years now you sell half, but you no, know. no. <laughs> so I I really thank you, Jeffrey, because it yeah. that I was I was super attached to that stone to be quite honest with you and I kind of put it out there as sell as a set so no one would buy yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> well, if it if if it means anything, I, I do know like my my Canadian collection is getting quite large here, and what I'm planning on doing at some point because um, I do belong to the Royal Astronomical Society. 
Um, but we do have the University of Alberta here as well with an extensive meteorite collection, but I was planning on posthumously at some point later on in life, um, donating my entire meteorite collection to the Royal Astronomical Society because wow. I find it kind of ironic that um, the, the society basically doesn't have any meteorites at all in its collection. It, it received some uh, a small donation here a, a few years back just because, again, a member thought it was kind of absurd that the organization didn't have any meteorites, but very small, very limited, and very little on the Canadian side of things. So it'll definitely be going to a, a long-term home later on, but I'm going to get very, very many years of enjoyment out of these first. <laughs> nice. well, I'm just. so happy. Thank you so much. I, 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 I'm so happy that you, that you were able to get those and they, they, you know, each meteorite has a home and I'm just, I'm just going to curate it until it finds its way there. So good on you, buddy. Thanks a lot for sharing that with us. Really you appreciate betcha. it. Yeah. And thanks for selling it to me. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> oh, no problem. Yeah. You, I, you that made was it one really happy. When, when it, when, <laughs> you were able to keep them together. <laughs> mo most people, when they ask for a discount, I'm like, ah, get out of here. You're like, oh no, hold on. Let me, let me, let me crunch some numbers here. Let me make this work. <laughs> It was more yeah. the currency exchange. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I truly appreciate it. And I'm glad, uh, you know, this is, uh, Jeff is an example of someone who found us on, on, uh, on uh, eBay or, or on YouTube and uh, connected with us as having conversations with my wife and learning more, and then is able to join us on the live uh, hangout. So it, these, these are open to anyone and everyone, and we encourage everyone at all levels to, to join us. Uh -huh. So. Thank you very I'm much. Thoroughly I'm enjoying my time. I'm learning lots and lots. So thank you. Oh, good it's deal. Been, it's been a blast. <laughs> I, I really appreciate it, man. That's, that's high pun. praise. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> we, we, were, we were paused just now and our man, our, our new VIP, Jeff, was telling us a little bit about Canadian law and Canadian meteorites. So pressure's yeah. on. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, so... So basically, any designated national or, or provincial park, uh, you're basically not allowed, well, you're, you're allowed to look, but you're not allowed to touch or take, right? And that's anything, whether it's a branch, a twig, a rock, uh, a flower, whatever the case may be, right? So in the right. case of the White Court uh, uh, crater and White Court meteorites, there is a designated area that the crater sits in and, and surrounding that there still are meteorites uh, in and those you're not allowed to, uh, to touch again you're allowed to look at but you're not allowed to touch or take so outside of that you are allowed to uh if if you do find or, or locate uh white court meteorites you're allowed to take those um but again it can't be within the provincially protected area uh so those are the ones that you would see out on the on the market for sale uh today so gotcha. um kind of cool that way so so yeah awesome. so again on private land if if Again, uh, a meteorite falls on private land. You need, you know, that that particular farmer or individual's permission if you want to take it. Most most individuals are more than happy to to sell them to you yeah. or let you even look on their property with with permission. Um, but yeah, as far as the provincial federal parks, you're not allowed to touch. You're just allowed to look. So, thank yeah. you. Appreciate that yep. uh, report from up north. Uh, and th those rules we're starting of thumb, to get cold. We're starting to get frosty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those, those rules of thumb can be applied here in America or wherever you are as well. Even if you have good intel that says there's rocks on a ground in this quadrant, and if that quadrant doesn't belong to you, it's always, always, always best to ask the, uh, the landowner for permission to hunt and then offer them a commission of what you find. Um, that way they benefit from it as well, but you're doing all the work and nine times out of 10, they'll, they'll probably say, just have at it, go nuts. You're going to give me something for free. Fine. Um, but it's all, it's always best to ask before you get shot, uh, or you do <laughs> yes. all the work and then someone else comes and takes it from you because it's theirs. I I'll reiterate that as well for, uh, for Canyon Diablo here in Arizona. There's a big mark in the ground where to start looking but i wouldn't do it if i were you <laughs> um, yeah and, and so, that's because it is private property yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. um while you were talking you sounded so awesome i'm just gonna flip it right over to you pat you got something to show us i do have a couple things to show let me change camera nice. yeah now it's working mm -hmm. uh so we're gonna go spend a little time in the wayback machine 
Um, this is one that I've had in my collection for a very long time. This is a, a Holbrook P uh -huh. that is actually from Nininger's uh, American Meteorite Laboratory. Oh, oh man. Uh -huh. and that's a full, uh, fully labeled and numbered uh, Holbrook and its uh, corresponding numbered uh, tag. That's a lot, wonderful. A lot of work for seven tenths of a gram. Of, yeah, no uh, doubt. Of Holbrook, but uh, mm. but cool nonetheless. Wow. And I'll just go. I'll just go on the record and state here: I do not have any hand numbered uh, Ninjers in my collection. So if anyone has one, they're not particularly attached to, and want to make it available, we can hook <laughs> up a deal. This one. Uh, has been in my collection for a long time too. This one is a Nininger uh, meteorite. Doggone it. Due to technical difficulties, we are going to Jim Shelton now. What's up, Jim? Hey, I'm going to back up a couple of topics here. First on uh, chondrules, uh, here's assorted sizes of chondrules. And I'm going to slip this off and you can see the metric scale underneath. So you, you kind of get it. I'll turn this around again. Mm -hmm. And in this other uh, container are a lot of loose chondrules, and they're very tiny. They're almost like sand. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Those chondrules that you had, how did, how did you get those chondrules out of the meteorite? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was, that's from... Uh, uh Saratov, which is a very friable meteorite. Mm. And I think wow. they fell out while they were cutting it. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I had a few chondrules laying around in my office that I like fell off of things and I put them in little baggies. <laughs> and when I finally got around to it, I like I need to I need to do something with these. So I put them in a, a package, uh, sent them over to uh to Pat. I'm like here, here's some microscope fun for you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're switching to Chris Monk. <laughs> hey, Chris, how's it going, bud? Hello, everyone. So, I'm one thing that I'd like to start off with is I'm not a micro collector. However, I had an opportunity to get some uh, micros mm. that I couldn't live without, and I'm going to give them to you in the order of importance to me. <laughs> mm, nice. So. I don't want to offend any of my European friends. So, Ensign? In, anybody? Yes, yeah, there you go. Ensign yep. time. So, small little micro. This I got as part of a group when I was trying to make a deal for well, this well, one. Well, let's go back to that one for a second. Let's not yeah. shortchange it, man. That, I don't want to it, shortchange it. It's super so important. This, it's super important it to you. Why? So this is this is a French fall that was, um, and cr again, correct me if I'm wrong. So this is part of, um, it, it was a witnessed fall in 1790s. Go back, go back further, a couple hundred years earlier. Yeah. 1892. It, it, there you go. Yep. And so some boy saw this fall. And, you know, everybody came rushing from the town and they took pieces of it. It ended up in a church and passed back and forth. And I think now it's in some um, kind of city hall type building or something. Mm -hmm. It started out as 100 kilos, if I'm not mistaken. And, and now it's at like 53 kilos, but super historic meteorite. Exactly. Correct. Thank you, man. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the first worldly uh, um, famously recognized um, witness falls. Mm -hmm. So this is the smallest of them, but Just you can't, smart. you can't be a Martian collector and not have a piece of Chisigny. Chisigny, yeah. Wow. So I, I had to get it little tiny micros. Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. But this is a super cool one that I've wanted for a long time. Any guesses? Oh, oh I yeah, we've I think seen I know it that before one. in the hangout. That's the only reason I know what it is. So this is Hoba. Yeah, this is the largest. This is a very much looks like a drilling. Some um, 
material that came off when they were drilling into it, probably for sampling purposes, but the largest meteorite in the world. Mm -hmm. It's in Africa. It is many, many, many tons. I want to say 60 tons. Yeah. Wherever it fell, it still sits. Getting chipped yeah, away it, at slowly. It, it's still, and I actually... I don't take forever. I'll show you. So I have most of the most of the samples that you can get of Hoba that are inexpensive or affordable. I should say, there's the Hoba right there. Most mm -hmm. of them you get are the shale that fall off the outside. Shale represents the uh, oxidized um, iron that falls off and, and is really uh, oxygenated and eroded away. Um, so what that is is actually like a drilling sample, like of real iron, not shale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was super excited. I've seen pieces come available before, um, similar to this drilling samples, and you know the I just couldn't justify paying what they were asking. But um, Al Alan Masur, yeah, um, hooked me up with this, and then for the last of my micros, but the one that I'm most proud of. Let me see if I can get the non scratch side. Anybody want to venture? I think I know. Is it, could that be the Mighty maybe? Merch? It, no, no, oh. it is not. More recent. Way more recent. Uh, Tarda, Kulang. Uh, Winchcomb. Wait, oh, Winchcomb. my God. Ooh, wow. That's a what? sizable Winchcomb. Dude, wow. I'll trade you my truck for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew in my heart that one day I would get a piece of this and... I, I tried and the pieces that were available were just way out of my price range, but I found a piece and I got it. And it's, it's, even though it's tiny, I mean, we can see how it's, tiny it is. It's not. That's not it, tiny for Winchcomb. No. no. Yeah. I'm, I'm super excited about this. This is, this is one of my favorite ones in my collection. That you you I, don't I handle that one because that's what pretty friable. Oh Yeah. Yeah, it's it's crumbles. If you if you look at it in the at the wrong angle, it falls apart. <laughs> wow, yeah, so that's amazing. That that's is, why I'm not taking it out. <laughs> yeah. Now that is the carbonaceous carbonaceous witnessed meteorite fall in the UK. The first witnessed meteorite in the UK in I think 36, 37 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it actually fell on the in the Wilcock home driveway oh. um so i've actually was fortunate enough to uh interview the wenchcomb um, the wenchcomb family the wilcock family uh on my youtube channel and found out just in the last couple of days the last couple of weeks they donated the driveway to the uh museum they literally <laughs> cut the patch of driveway up and it's now in a museum <laughs> on display nice. wow that's, that's amazing thank you chris wow it Congrats. Yeah, that's all that's all I got today. Well, and I, I do want to add uh, one note. Let me see here. Um, how can I stop that? There we go. Uh, I do want to add one note on that Chesigny that you showed us. And I touched on this last week when Cameron showed his three samples. Uh, Chesigny is the witnessed meteorite fall that's a Martian. And that was the first of its class ever found. So all other Martian meteorites in that class are named after Chesigny. So they're Chesignites. So you have Chesignites, Shergatites after Shergati, and uh, Noclites after Nokla. So you have the three main classes of, of Martians, and they're all named after the first meteorite that was classified with that uh, geochemistry. Um, but that, that Wenchcomb is just... Sexy bag, dude. Yeah, I'll trade you my truck for it, but you're gonna have to fill it up with gas. That's kind of like the break even <laughs> point. <laughs> it looks looks like Pat has his technical difficulties in hand. Well, uh, let's hope. <laughs> so, uh, so there are uh, a couple more Holbrooks. These uh, these unfortunately are not hand numbered uh, like that one, but I believe that they are quite old uh pieces uh the, the bo both from edwin thompson and uh the uh the crust on these things is just insanely fresh they oriented um i 
this one might show a little orientation, but not not a not a serious amount. Mm-hmm. But and uh, what's crazy about those, Pat, as you just kind of alluded to, you mentioned there's fresh crust, but that's a hundred year old crust. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, this meteorite fell in 1912 in uh, in Holbrook. Uh, Navajo County in Arizona, and uh, we got to hunt that one too, which was pretty exciting. All right, we're out here in Hallbrook. It is windy as hell, and I just found one. Woo! Okay, can you find it? Yeah. Um, and then let's see, I've got another one from the Wayback Machine. Um, this is North Northeast Africa. Oh wow. Wow. I, I didn't catch that at first. <laughs> yeah. Zero zero one. I had I had to look it up because I first uh, read it as Northwest Africa. It's like I didn't think I had Northwest Africa zero zero one. <laughs> And, no, and it is that. it is a micro. There's just a, a bit in there, but it's one of the early lunars. Mm. And, uh, and the old uh, uh, hoopé label on it, the yes. small little. What if it's uh if it was green, it had crust. If it was red, it did this. If it was orange, it had that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then oh, back yeah. in the day, um, we didn't have Northwest Africa meteorites and we didn't have Sahara 99, whatever, and 97, whatever. And so most uh, meteorites that were available to the collector community were American meteorites and Australian meteorites. And mm-hmm. the Australian meteorites, especially from the, uh, from the outback, had uh, some wonderful names. This one is called Billy Goat Donga. Billy Goat Donga. <laughs> and um, the... Uh, you know, per the the nomenclature committee, uh, meteorites that are that are found that we know, uh, you know, a, a known location, not a nova or a dense collection area, but a, you know, a known location, uh, they get named for the nearest post office or human settlement or what have you. And in the outback, there are a lot of these big cattle stations, sheep stations, mm-hmm. and so forth. So uh, Donga is one of the uh, Billy Goat Donga is one of the uh, uh, one of those ranches out in the middle of nowhere. Mm. And then uh, continuing with the theme of, uh, sorry, no, that's 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 a beautiful size piece of Allende. Theme of the Wayback Machine. This yeah. is uh, an Allende purchased from Edwin Thompson back when Allendes were four bucks a gram. <laughs> um, I got beautiful, beautiful. Th- this one is a really nicely little oriented stone. Yeah. yeah. And uh, many of the Allende's uh, had kind of nasty looking crust. The uh, a lot of the rocks were not um, handled very carefully in the field, and uh, Allende uh, tends to spall off the crust anyhow. But the crust on this one is just absolutely super fresh and lovely. Wow. Large CAIs mm. in the uh, Allende, too. Yeah, Allende does, does, show, uh, does show nice CAIs. And my, my bigger oriented one is downstairs. Wow. But uh, uh, this is another uh... <laughs> oriented one. Um, and this is also another uh, Edwin Thompson four buck a gram Allende. This one is very nicely oriented. So there's yeah. the back side. And if I can get it to focus, yeah, it is focusing. Let me change the line. Oh yeah, you can see dripping. Yeah, you can see the flow uh, lines from the front side yeah. Yeah. wrapping around to the back side. And then yeah. there's a marked difference in the uh, in the character of the crust. 
That's a keeper from the side uh, to to the back. So uh, another uh, another one from the wayback machine, and then um, back in the day before the internet, um, we didn't get to buy meteorites from photos. Uh, we bought meteorites from uh, Xerox lists of meteorites. This is a David New meteorite that I bought directly from David New. Mm -hmm. And they came wrapped in this old fashioned material and then wrapped up in a, in a piece of paper. Mm. And this is a fragment of Allende mm -hmm. with that old David New label. And you can see the, uh, yeah. the puffy cloud type CAIs and the fractured surface there. Yeah, n normally I'd go I go for the CAIs, but on the other pieces, man, that crust is screaming at me. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, I, I was I, I high graded quite a few um, Allende's to find that one. Of course, the value has gone up considerable since the when you purchased it. Yeah, yeah, it's not four bucks a gram anymore, unfortunately. No, no. <laughs> and uh, this is go for it. Okay, and then this one is a uh, uh, a much more recent one. This is uh, eleven seven seven three, uh, a type three, but uh, you can see how how beautiful the chondrules are and how they uh, how distinct they are. Mm -hmm. That's some nice crust too. Yeah. And yeah. they vary in size a lot in that slice too. They do. And so um, you know, another um, Meteorite 101 thing is that uh, between H and L and LL in the ordinary chondrites, so as we go from high metal to low metal to very low metal, there's also a characteristic uh, average size of chondral difference. Uh, mm -hmm. The H3s tend to have much smaller chondrules. The Ls have larger chondrules and the LLs have even larger chondrules yet on average. Mm -hmm. So it's another, another clue that we use for classification. Uh, it's not always true, but, but uh, in general, it's quite true. Yeah. Um, but there's a really interesting uh, exception to that. And you know, Daniel was talking briefly about megachondrules. And uh, megachondrules can be present. They're, they're very rare and very scarce. But they can be present in um, even L... Uh, 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 I'm sorry, in type 6 chondrules. So even though the... Um, uh, most of the chondrules are erased, uh, they, uh, they can still show chondrules and they can actually still show megachondrules. Mm -hmm. And then we were talking about clasts. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, a wonderful uh, meteorite that I got from Chris Caldwell. This is the one that was missing in action in the Postal Service for six weeks. Huh. Um, but it's, uh, it's under classification. Uh, but it is uh, probably a CV3 and shows some really interesting chondrules and shows a clast. So mm, a uh, square one. one. Blocky um, shaped clast. Yeah. yeah. So when we, um, when we were talking about um, uh, ordinary chondrites, you know, we can see clasts uh, in them of different uh, classifications and so forth. This one is, you know, probably a CV3. Uh, mm. And then this inclusion is uh, possibly a um, CO3. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very blocky, very angular chunk. Is and that then, a shock vein running through it? Yeah, that's uh, what I was thinking. This thing here? Yeah, it looks, yeah, it looks like a shock vein. No, I think it's actually a cutting uh, oh. uh, artifact. I think the blade was dragging there. I've not done any lapping on this one. 
uh, at this point. Because it goes right across the class and to, no, the, to the to they're the they're left. talking about the horizontal line. Yeah. The, yeah. The, oh, the curved one. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a there. that's a weathering crack. That's actually a crack. Yeah. That's that's a crack across the uh, across the the whole meteorite here, and then it continues. Yeah. Up into here, um, yep. CV threes. And again, I'm making an assumption this is not classified, so I can't call it a CV3. I have to call it CV3 provisional or possible CV3. Um, they tend to crack. They're, they're like many of the carbonaceous chondrites, they're more fragile. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's very, very common to see cracks in them. Mm -hmm. Also, when they dehydrate, they crack. Exactly. True. Mm -hmm. um, and this is probably a CAI rather than a class. I don't know for mm -hmm. sure, but it's a really interesting one. It's a very homogeneous color yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and has a very distinct uh, boundary around it. Um, Daniel, what do you, I know this is not the greatest picture in the world, but what do you think? Of, of, of that inclusion right there? Yeah, CAI? Uh, it's, it's possible. It's kind of a little hard to see with uh, with the lighting, but it yeah, it could be a possibility. What's the what's the size of it? A, f a few millimeters, or is it approaching a centimeter size? Um, it is um, an overall length approaching a centimeter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard to hard to say, but yeah, prob most likely guess would be CAI or some. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one of the one of the things one of the takeaways for me from the uh, the meteoritical society meeting uh, is that there are many Mike many Mike check types. oh sorry uh, test how now yep mm -hmm. um, uh, there are several different types of of CAIs this is another slice of the same uh, meteorite from Chris Colville um, and it shows uh, one of I the I believe you mean Chris Colvin. Uh, thank you. Yes, yep. Colvin. Uh, it, it shows a, a round, very well incorporated CAI here that I believe mm -hmm. is a CAI. Uh, some of the puffy cloud uh, sort of, of CAIs as well. And then the one but, over here. This is cross polarized light? Yeah, uh, yes. This, there's a little bit of room light in there, but mostly it's a reflector cross polarized light. Mm -hmm. And then in this corner mm -hmm. shows another. Uh, inclusion of that uh, possible CO3 uh, material as well. Very wow. nice. So yeah, that is really interesting. I, I like the fact that the CAIs are of different, you know, they, they're different types and I'm not intelligent enough to know the difference right now, but like that one you showed right there is a perfectly round circle. There's mm -hmm. others with ambiguous gaseous mm -hmm. looking uh, um, lines. And then mm -hmm. that one on the other side looks totally, or on the other slice, I mean, <laughs> looks total uh, homogenous throughout it uh, and literally has no, like, that brain tissue structure in it. Right. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and on this one, the internal structure is very uh, homogeneous and fine-grained as well, hmm. whereas uh, it, it's quite typical for CAIs to have some some internal structure and even this this well incorporated uh spherical one uh has some some internal structure uh detail to it wow. the the elongated uh cai is that a sign that that was still in a plastic a molten state before it solidified uh, no we don't think so so okay. uh cais are what which stands for calcium aluminum mm -hmm. inclusion yeah. uh are uh refractory materials they're, they okay. were formed at a very high temperature uh and uh so we believe that for our planetary disk that means that they were formed close to the sun right. um but uh cais are an enigma in that uh we believe they were formed close to the sun they're depleted in volatiles mm -hmm. um and yet they are incorporated in carbonaceous chondrites which are chock full of volatiles, including hydrocarbons and a mm -hmm. bunch of other wonderful yeah. stuff and water, as Topher pointed out. Uh, and so uh, there's all sorts of, of theories and thoughts about how did we, uh, how, how did this 
uh, refractory high temperature formed material CAI, and the CAIs are also quite old. They form first, and they mm -hmm. also form a milepost for dating uh, other uh, rocks in the in the in the protoplanetary disk. Uh, so, how did these things form close to the sun, and then get transported away from the sun? And and the 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 boundary that is usually used for towards the sun or away from the sun is the orbit of Jupiter. So how did they form inside the orbit of Jupiter close to the sun and then all get transported uh, beyond Jupiter and yeah. incorporated in these volatile, rich carbonaceous chondrites? Hmm. Uh, a, one, a wonderful mystery. Wow. That's a cool I, are, question. Question, sure. Pat or Daniel, are CAIs electrically conductive? No, I I don't believe so, but I can put an ohmmeter on these. But no, I, uh, they they are uh, they're not metallic objects. Um, they um, are they they appear to be oxidized objects rather than reduced objects. Thank you. Hey Pat. Yes. Your uh, Billy Goat Donga. Do you have uh, Mulga North from Australia? I'd I do well. At least I did have a piece of Mulga North. Um, don't know where it is right off. I, I seriously need to invest in some uh, display cabinets. But I'm. Uh, I was going to say those two are cool because they have uh, overlapping strewn fields, north, south, uh, and, oh. and east, west, along with uh, also um, Mulga South. Right. Cool. So they, they make a good display together. If you you drum that one up. Nice. I, I'll shoot you the paper later. Okay, cool. Thank you. Hey, Pat, if it's possible, do you think you can send me a picture of the, the class in, in that meteorite? If that's possible? With a, in, a in, scale bar? I, either, either one. Yes. Th one. These two? Sure. Yes. Awesome. And if you, if you make the pictures high quality enough, they go in the thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> it is that time of the weekly bolide, our 70th one in a row, by the way that we check in with our contributors around the globe. This week, we are very pleased to have Marco back, Marco Geiser from Germany. And uh, last two weeks, he's uh, honored us with astrophotography videos. He's a quite accomplished astrophotographer and took advantage of an equipment upgrade and some clear nights back to back to back in order to get some really amazing astrophotography. So if you missed those, look back over the last two weeks. They're absolutely amazing. One of them focused on the sun and the other one was on distant galaxies. Well, I guess there isn't any close galaxies. But today... He's back to meteorites, and can what are we looking at today, guys? Anyone know what this is? It's a palisite. Exactly. Does anyone know what palisite? Super, MLAC, super green. Yeah, I was going to say MLAC is probably a good, good uh, guess. Hmm. Right. Golden. Let's take a look and see what he has to say. Hello everyone, how are you doing? Yeah guys, today I want to show you something uh, different, not usual for me. Um, it's not an oriented meteorite, but a very nice palisite. So come on, let's have a look on that piece. Yeah, here we go. That's the piece that I wanted to show today. It's uh, one of that very, I would say, fresh finds of Imilek. That piece, um, a complete and very fresh individual, weighs about 97.8 grams. Nice. And what I really love on that piece are those green olivine crystals. Look mm -hmm. at that. Yep. The piece also shows uh, fusion crust, which I think it's really amazing. And here we have the other side of the piece. That's electric. It's crazy. crazy. The stone, of course, is cleaned. So that's definitely not the in situ condition or as found condition, but it is very carefully cleaned. Yeah. And yeah, I really like that. Because if you over clean this, 
those crystals will just come right out. Yep, and you'd shine up the metal too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Imlac is uh, is a very interesting palisite in that it has a very long terrestrial age. It's it's been on the ground for a long, long time, and mm. it is it is the gold standard of stability in palisites. Yeah, and it it's absolutely gorgeous, and this is a great example. Um, and this one is not out of Africa. It's, this is not out of the dense collection area we know as NWA. This is out of Chile. So it's Chilean. Right. And a fusion crust, which I think it's really amazing. And here we have the other side of the piece. Wow. Beautiful. The stone, of course, is cleaned. So that's definitely not the in situ condition or as found condition, but it is very carefully cleaned. And yeah, I really like that. You can see the fractured olivines just give, oh. What is there. super amazing is that uh, the finder of the piece, and I bought it directly from the finder, um, provided an uh, in-situ photo with all the GPS coordinates. So the piece nice. was found on 22nd January in 19. So wow. that is really cool. <laughs> that is amazing. And that's wow. the stone right here in the middle. Be so easy to walk past that. Yeah, no doubt been sitting there but for the a real long beauty time. of that piece is only visible under the microscope so come on let's have a look through the microscope yeah okay Ooh, guys wow. so welcome to the beautiful world of imelec absolutely look at those olivine crystals here the angular crystals The other thing that's interesting too is the the color of the olivine is uh, between magnesium and iron substitution. They substitute for each other, and the green is at the far magnesium end and is much less common to see on the palisites. Mm. Great info. So these are the true colors of the stone. I did not. Uh changed any saturation or something like that this is real <laughs> it's hard to <laughs> believe what we believe you <laughs> <clears throat> this is a really beautiful stone look at all these cracks and crevices and angles that have all of you tucked away yes, in this uh, remnant fusion crust on that piece mm -hmm. oh yes Almost looks like a little roll over there. Also here you can see the flow lines on the fusion crust. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's a remarkable. So those new finds of Imelik are really amazing. If also you... here, look the fusion crust on that uh, olivine crystal here. That's crazy beautiful. That wasn't made in China. Also here. If you look right here, you can literally see. Uh, let me see if I can turn this tool on. You can literally see where the fusion crust is covering the olivine and it's chipped away. Mm -hmm. So this is fusion crust, and directly underneath that is this olivine. Wow, it's gorgeous. Whoops! No, not Marissa time yet. It's not Marissa time. I swear. <laughs> We might rewatch re some of this. There we go. I thought it was a little funny. I swear that uh, Marco and I don't work together on these, but he sent this video so over. So these are the true colors of the... He sent this video over, and I acknowledge that I received a video. Meanwhile, I was working on a video myself. And it just happened to be for a fusion crusted Imalac with flow lines in the fusion crust. 
So it, 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 we had a serendipitous uh, moment this morning when we made contact with each other. We're like, are you kidding me? We did it again. <laughs> Don't. Yes, Matt. I did not uh, change any saturation or something like that. This is real. <laughs> I believe you. I believe you. That's beautiful. I'd have to Look sell here. everything I Here's own. Here's a remnant fusion crust on that piece. I'm remarkable. Also here you can see the flow lines on the fusion crust. A lot of character. So those new finds of Imelik are really amazing. Also here, look, the fusion crust on that uh, olivine crystal here. A mild coating of Chilean dust. <laughs> look at that. Also here. This is a beautiful... For me, such pieces are real space art. Mm. I wonder what those measure at. Those olivine crystals. Well, yeah, that's 91 grams, you said. something. Hmm. Uh, wow. Beautiful. I think. Mean. Look at... The, you Literally, the fusion crust patches have been removed for, for you to see the olivine. Stunning. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Does it look oriented from that angle, Marco? Maybe it does qualify in your collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guys. I hope you like the piece that I showed today. Maybe you have also nice Imelec individuals to show or slices. Because for me, Imelec is one of the most beautiful palisades um, out there. Because it's yeah, obviously wonderful and amazing, and of course very stable. Mm -hmm. That's also a very important thing. So I wish you a fantastic hangout, have fun, and goodbye from Germany. Awesome. See you next week. Bye bye, guys. Thanks, Marco. Appreciate it, buddy. Yeah, am amazing stuff. Uh, an another thing that that's great about Emilac, I mean, it's it's expensive, but it's not outrageous it's not fu kang it's not escal it's not mm -hmm. you know you're not paying 60 to 80 bucks a gram for it it's huh. in the reasonable category we'll call it that yeah it's but, been in the 25 buck a gram range for a long time it's one of those ones that seems to have very stable pricing the the pricing on it is going up now and it it's is. weird because more is being found and therefore it's coming available People who have had it for a while aren't selling their pieces. So when it becomes available, people want it and they're paying more for it. <clears throat> yeah, that's all. It's supply and demand. And yeah. uh, once you throw a few internet billionaires into the mix, yeah. yeah. Buyers market. Yeah. Someone, would you please give Elon my information? He loves <laughs> Mars. I have Mars. <laughs> <you know? laughs> uh, uh, right now, it is, oh, I forgot to put the pictures in, Marissa. I'm so sorry. Oh, God. Oh. I've been so uh -oh. busy today. Like, literally, when I take my coffee break at work, I work on the presentation for tonight for five minutes at a time. But I forgot to put pictures in. But Marissa has been, been doing some amazing photography. I'm hoping that she's still in the room with us. Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, awesome. Cool. Thank you. Feel free to talk because you know more about this than I do. These are just stunning. So I'll, I'll show you which ones I include it real quickly and we can run through them. And then there's a video actually at the end. So, <laughs> excuse me. What I thought was interesting in some of these, and maybe you can expound on this a little when you do uh, enlighten us, Marissa, but a lot of them seem to be uh, the same feature with different termination in the polarization light. So I don't know if this, I don't think this is the, the same, but I included some that are the exact same feature just under different lighting. Mm -hmm. 
which obviously he's not going to pull up now, but look at how gorgeous these are. Mm. I, I hope Neil Bucklin is not watching this hangout, but <laughs> Marissa, you know who Neil Bucklin is, right? He, mm, he, I think I've okay. heard of him. He better watch his back. Let's just say that. <laughs> uh, what Neil does is he takes pictures of thin sections it, with a amazing process that he's designed, developed, and a whole housing for it. But basically, his thin sections can be blown up to fill a wall 18 feet by 30 feet Ooh. with absolutely zero uh, resolution drop, no pixelation, no nothing. Wow. Uh, he better look over his shoulder because I know a little girl is going to be chasing him down soon. Look at this stuff. This absolutely. is crazy. Wait, look at this one. Fantastic. Look oh, my that. goodness. That's definitely a polysomatic barred olivine, I hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I'm pretty sure it's a mix. It's, it's definitely olivine, of course, but the, the so top right-hand corner, you mm -hmm. know, is uh, probably um, pyroxene because it's, mm -hmm. you know, all gray and dark colors and... It's really interesting how the striations go in at least four directions. There. Yeah, yeah, it's fabulous. And, and then over here, they look all crumbled up together, like they intersected in like a deck of cards being uh, um, being shuffled. shuffled. Yeah, it's fabulous. Now, this next one, this next image, is what I was talking about, captured with right. different light Ooh. termination. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Uh, the image on the left is with the wave plate in, and it's of course still cross polarized light, but the wave plate puts it like off a little bit, so it's maybe I'd have to read into that, and it might be one fourth polarization. That I, I'm going to have to read in of what the wave plate is actually doing, but I know it it changes the colors so that you can identify different minerals mm -hmm. and besides the whole okay, things that i uh understand i can appreciate scientifically things that i want to understand and i'm interested in i can understand artistically so yes. i'm looking at this purely as scientific art That's but cool. it's enthralling that you can those are drastically different images or artwork, if you will, that you've created with different technical technical tools. It's mind numbing. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I was pretty blown away by the left image when when I put the wave plate in and and some the, I've taken a video of that one too because it was just so amazing. And they're all on my Facebook page and some are on the meteorite pages, but that one just, it was just stunning. You definitely protect your thin slices from the effects of dust and any kind of foreign debris that could compromise the, uh, the photos you take. I, I mean, these are just uh, awesome beyond words. Wait. This right here, actually, I, I don't even know what classification I'm looking at. It just has. Like, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that chondral, well, I zoomed in quite a bit. It was back in the first few images, mm -hmm. um, but that's with wave plate in. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. this one. And that's with the wave plate is not in it. Oh, and I got gotcha. you. With my old microscope like this, chondral is actually pretty big. Um, I have to get a, a measuring tool to measure it, but uh, with my old microscope, I couldn't tell what it was. I saw the blue that says it's olivine, but other than that, and the bottom half was the, the reddish tinge, and I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And then once I got the new microscope and I could zoom in, I saw all those fine bars, and mm -hmm. I said, "Oh my God! It's it looks like a barred olivine, but yeah. unless you zoom in, you can't tell." So I asked um, 
I asked Daniel his opinion <laughs> because I didn't know what it was. But the bottom half was what threw me off and I didn't know what to call it. <laughs> and he said the bottom half is it could be weathered or it could be pyroxene. But mm -hmm. he said it was basically a, a complex chondral. Wow. Absolutely. But those bars are so fine. I've never seen that before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at how, like, literally, they're microscopic little mm -hmm. lines, you know? Yeah. And, and the, this chondral is what I videoed at the end. Yeah. Let's and, take a look and at that. You really, you really can't tell by just zooming out from it and it just all looked like see you can't tell mm -hmm. but you can see depth to it it's, yeah. which is wild rotating the stage yeah look at that termination just goes away and then fills back in mm -hmm. wow it's definitely mosaicized wow now, uh, Daniel, that, that uh, mosaic undular extinction, that is from uh, shock? Yes, that is, that is due, that is, that, that's primarily due to shock where you get different, uh, essentially shock, what it does is when you have shock to this extent, you actually form different domains within mm -hmm. the structure of uh, either some of the chondrules or some of the grains themselves. So it could be one of two, this could be definite indicator of shock, or it could be that you incorporated many different uh, bits of other material that just all went together in one chondral, but it mm. looks like shock affected this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, cool. Wow. I've never this... shared this video, so I wanted it to debut mm -hmm. on here. I've been saving this one. Yeah, I'm I'm super pumped. I, when I woke up this morning and saw I had uh, videos and, and well, photos and a video from you, I was like, sweet. And then you were like, I'm not going to spam you with a bunch of them. Like, don't just give them to me each week, just in digestible <laughs> bites. These are amazing. Uh, I, it almost good. feels criminal after that beautiful thing to bring up the fact that I'm having a live sale, self promotion, self promotion, but I got to keep the lights on. So, October 2nd, I'm having a live sale. It's going to be on Zoom. So, it's going to be just like this format. You're going to be able to see the videos as close, uh, the meteorites as, as close as I show my normal hangout items. So you're going to get a really good look at them. It's a fun event and you, everything's going to be probably at least 10% off. My low prices are already. I don't need to be discounting, but I want to encourage you guys to come out. So hopefully you'll make, put that in your schedule. And we'll check in with uh, Mike Kelly. Mike, how are Thank you? Thank you, Marissa, for, uh, for oh. showing your, uh, your, uh, uh, Photos and uh, the video of that uh, chondral is just super beautiful, and uh, I, it's wonderful that that Daniel was able to see the uh, uh, the mosaic uh, part of it. Really cool stuff. Very nice yeah. video, Marissa. That that was incredible of the chondral. Very nice. Yeah, thank, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank thank you, Pat, for keeping my polite meter in check as well. I no I, worries. <laughs> I have so many things going on in my brain, but yes, Mar Marissa, thank you very much for, for including us. And we're, we're, we're honored to have you on our bolide crew for sure. So I can't wait for next week. You give me a few more and, you know, just trickle them to me. <laughs> uh, now we'll check in with, we'll check in with Mike Kelly now and see what's up. Uh, hey, how's it going guys? Very well. Howdy, Mike. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. A couple, couple pieces I wanted to show off this week. Um, this one's kind of neat because this is a uh, NWA thirteen seven seven seven. So this is a CK six anomalous, and it's anomalous in its incredibly low iron content in olivine. Um, uh, so that's a a one of one uh, based on its classification. So I thought that was nice. kind of cool. Congrats, so class boy. Yeah, yeah, it's a that was a fun one. Mm -hmm. So moving up slightly in the how many there are's. Um, these, uh, these just got added to the Met Bowl. Uh, so there's now two of these total, uh, Diogenite melt breaches nice. uh, are now a recognized class. Uh, so this is 14, one, two, nine. It's a classification held by, uh, Salamo, uh, Yoda meteorites. Um, and it's got a, it's a, it's a pretty cool looking Diogenite. Uh, I haven't yeah, seen really, it. Really, really yeah. dark. 
Yeah, really dark, uh, and you do get those brecciated uh, clasts in there, you can see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, so. and fairly fine grains, too. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty mm -hmm. interesting material, so mm -hmm. I'd be, uh, be interested to know what that looks like under thin section. Wow. Um, and then kind of the last one moving up in the aren't too many ohms is, is this guy right here. Uh, and this is probably the fancy, nice, newest piece out of Denver that got talked about. So that is Grapevine Mesa. So oh, that is a wow. provisional CBA. Um, wow. And obviously, uh, based on based on uh, on what it is, I got a, a, a tenth of a gram there. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was happy that uh, when I got it, uh, I put a magnet next to it because I was thinking it would probably be a shale. Uh, mm -hmm. And it hopped right to the magnet. Nice. Yeah. And nice. Then when I was, uh, see if I can, there, you can see it's, you can see it's metallic. Oh, when yeah. I was uh, mm -hmm. cutting it, I was uh, dry diamond wire sawing it. Uh, and it was getting nice and hot. So uh, at that <laughs> point, I knew I had a, yeah. a good solid Beautiful. metal piece. For nice. for those on on YouTube that don't know, this is a brand new meteorite that's under classification right now, found by Todd Parker here in in uh, Arizona where I live, and right. it is a ultra rare bencubinite. It, so it's it's a bencubinite class, which you probably haven't heard us yes. talk about that much on this show. That's how rare it is. Yeah, this is total unobtainium. Yeah. yeah so there's there's 21 total. Uh, and carbonites, if you include the uh, the breakdown of the subclasses, mm -hmm. um, uh, eliminate out the Antarctics, and you have ten achievable ones. Um, you know that are that are non Antarctic, so they're available to collectors, uh, and uh, most of them are are not high total known weights, uh, yeah. and are are really hard to come by. So. Uh, I'm really happy to have uh, this little bit, and this is uh, this is number seven for me. So I'm yeah. lagging behind some of the people who are really into the Bencubonites, but I'm I'm definitely glad to uh, to have this one, which would be uh, they're thinking it's going to be a subtype uh, A, so CBA, oh, nice. uh, and there's uh, this would be the eighth one of those. Um, wow! For for those uh, anyone out there who does have a pocket full of cash and cannot live another day without this Ben Covenant in their collection. A uh, friend of the Bolide, Roberto Vargas, has yeah. rare, I mean, end cuts. I'm talking about 15 gram end cuts, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, they're, they're, they're larger end cuts. Uh, they're etched, they're beautiful. They actually show the, uh, a similar look as Gujba almost, where you can tell it's a Ben Covenite. So shameless plug, but for a friend this time, Roberto Vargas has the Great Vine Mesa. Yep. My precious. And then I, I thought this one was pretty cool um, just because of recent events. Uh, so this is Vivers, uh, and that's a, uh, a 2AB iron from Australia. Oh, um, what's it called? Vevers, V E E V E R S. Wow. Okay. Nice. Never heard of it. Nice. Um, and so, what's neat about that is, uh, you know, this is one of the irons that's associated with an unknown crater. So, Vevers Crater in Australia, which was found in 1975. And it's an 80 meter crater. Uh, mm -hmm. And kind of the things I thought that was cool about this is uh, the total listed Met Bull weight is only 300 grams. <laughs> Uh, mm. Even though the estimated uh, size of the meteorite was between a uh, hundred and a thousand tons, jeez. Wow. So I know uh, I know Chris showed off uh, Hoba, uh, which uh, which there is sixty tons. So you can imagine, you know, a hundred tons to start with, and you yeah. only get uh, three hundred listed grams total. Um, wow! But what I thought was interesting about this too. Was, uh, they found it in 75, but they didn't uh, connect it to being uh, meteoritic in origin until 1984, uh, when the Shoemakers of uh, Shoemaker Levy 9 fame uh, oh, yes. were actually the ones who discovered uh, the little bits of uh, meteoritic iron around the crater and the uh, impact structure around it. Yes. Um, and unfortunately, Carolyn Shoemaker just recently passed away. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. But I thought that uh, that Mike, made I have, I have a question. I have a question for you to clarify. 
Sure. Was Weaver's crater known before the meteorite? Uh, I mean, yes. So yeah. So the crater was seen uh, and, and spotted uh, by aerial flyover in in seventy five, and okay. then the iron wasn't discovered until eighty four. So okay. yes, the the, the, okay. the crater was and, and, known well before the iron was. So I mean, it didn't take much to really link it to being the crater and being meteoritic. It just took someone really to do that. I'm like, I'm I'm a little confused as why it took so long. You know. Yeah, and I, I guess maybe that that uh, ties in with like I said, there's only 300 grams listed. Wow! Uh, I'm yeah. I'm trying to dig around and find out if they're you know what the total is in reality, which is kind of hard with the Met Bowl, but yeah, uh, yeah. So there's not not much there, I wow, guess, awesome. left of that original hundred to a thousand tons. Jeez, I'm you know, glad you shared of, that uh, with us, man. Kind of like well, this. would that have been due to an airburst that uh, just vaporized most of it and some uh, smaller pieces survived uh i think it i think it more it pulled the canyon diablo you know yeah. and it, uh, it impacted and vaporized and so mm -hmm. you only find uh, little bits here and there yeah. uh yeah. you know i you know i definitely i don't think it was an airburst it was a it was a good impact yeah, yeah. the uh, yeah. the nickel iron meteorites um uh, they uh, of that side of sort of size the reason that they have enough energy to create that kind of a creator is that they really don't slow down very much going through yeah. the atmosphere. And so yeah. they make a very, very high energy arrival. And uh, uh, most of the meteorite is, is vaporized. Mm -hmm. um, nice. Yep. Cool. And then the, the last piece I got, and because everybody needs a good looker or two. Oh. There's oh, a, a nice... nice chunk of uh r3 cool so oh that's, no, that's beautiful one that's three the, uh, one three seven eight five no this is uh one four one two six oh wow even a newer one, one. Uh, so yeah this is wow. this is one of uh salamo's classifications um yeah. so that's uh, my current large r slice but fantastic uh, i saw I, I saw the brecciation in there and yeah that, wow absolutely yeah big shout out to yoda meteorites on ebay guys he, he's very trustworthy with beautiful material i have several of his things in my collection wow. hey mike that's a screamer yeah. thank hey, you mike mm. yeah it looks like you're moving up from micros on <laughs> <laughs> you know what they say i, I, I guess, yeah. guess y'all can see me now huh <laughs> Yeah. yeah, diversity is the spice of life. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's awesome. This is a, a new uh, new member, Jason. How are you, buddy? Yeah, yeah. I just talked to you the other day, Topher. I've been watching y'all for a while, man. Um, man, I've got some tremendous knowledge from y'all. All right, guys, that was a full week. I had to lower people's hands. We're out of time. See you next week. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you showing up and helping out. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.